Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of This Week in Innovation. I'm flying solo today as my, my podcast partner, Brian, is out doing venture capital things. But today, uh, we will be talking about some really interesting data that just was just re recently published. My guest today will be Roshan Junja, General Manager of Square, to talk about this, the recent study. Hey, Roshan, how are you doing today? Good. How's it going, Jeff? Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Well, I'm really looking forward to digging into some of this data. Um, as we get started, why don't you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do at, at Square? Yeah, so uh, I'm the head of retail at Square. Uh, I've been at the company for about six years now. Uh, and in a nutshell, my goal is to empower retailers of all shapes and sizes to thrive by leveraging the platform at Square. Um, I oversee all aspects of the vertical here, including uh, creating the best experience for retailers who run their businesses on Square's software and hardware. Wow, fantastic. So you just published um, Festive Forecast 2022. Can I ask you a few questions about some of the data? Yeah, please do. Awesome. Well, let's start with this. And for everyone that's audio, I, I'll have these screenshots in our, our notes. I'll try to describe the points we're going to talk about. But this might be a really good one to actually pop over to YouTube and look at the actual video for. So the first, the first slide we're going to talk about is the, the key findings, festive findings wrapped up. And I noticed shoppers feel the squeeze is, is probably, I think, your lead takeaway. What, um, how do you think inflation is going to impact retail 2022? Yeah, uh, definitely a top of mind, um, you know, on both sides of the, the equation, right? Both for our shoppers and for people that are selling. Uh, and I think what's happening is um, probably a version of what's happened at all the prior times. There's been, you know, these, these macroeconomic issues that are reducing um, spending power. And what that is, is I think folks are um, thinking a little bit more carefully about their purchasing. Um, there's still a lot of interest in spending. Uh, I think a lot of what we saw in this survey and elsewhere was that shoppers still want to shop. But I think what we're going to see is a reduction uh, potentially in um, kind of more frivolous or kind of impulse buying, a little bit more deliberation in terms of what they go out uh, to purchase. Uh, and I also, uh, and this is, um, you know, not only in our findings, but what we're hearing more broadly, more of an interest in um, kind of thinking about viable alternatives. So maybe not, you know, the the top luxury brand of something, but, uh, you know, something that's, you know, close in quality, but, uh, but less expensive. And so that's uh, just a few of the ways that I would imagine shoppers are going to um, be behaving this holiday season. The uh, one of the findings was slay with afterpay. And the data point is one out of six Americans use BNPL, buy now, pay later. Um, that I was actually kind of surprised by that. That seems pretty high. Is that is that an ongoing growth trajectory? I'm sure since you invested in that, you think that's the case. But is it always been that high? One out of six Americans? Yeah. You know, one of the ways to look at this is uh, it's a place where I think Australia actually led the charge in terms of introducing this concept of buy now, pay later. Uh, you know, and for a variety of reasons, it sort of, uh, you know, grabbed a lot of traction. So, so this percentage looks a little, lot higher over there. But as it's made its way over to the U.S., uh, we certainly see um, the highest adoption, I think, is in online selling. Uh, and and what, you're, uh, what you would find is that it gives consumers a way to have a little bit more predictability in terms of when they have to pay for something by spreading it out in these equal payments. Uh, but one of the, the prime drivers behind um, uh, our acquisition, uh, or one of the many uh, benefits, I would say, is that uh, we're now able to offer this in store as well. And so it just uh, it's yet another way that Square is trying to take these uh, emerging trends and make sure that they're omni-channel ready and that our sellers can take advantage of them wherever their buyers are. You know, I probably should have asked you uh, at the start, but your client base is, I mean, I think I've seen... Uh, garage sales using your technology all the way up to how, how large of a retailer do you get to? Oh, um, you know, I would say some household names. Um, you know, recently we, uh, we have uh, a partnership with SoFi Stadium. I think what's kind of interesting that a lot of folks don't know is that, as you point out, Square is really well known for that smaller seller, whether it's, you know, garage sales, pop-up markets and food trucks. But, um, you know, it's been several years now that we've been uh, creating solutions that appeal to upmarket sellers, uh, tackling more complex needs in the case of retail, things like inventory management and reporting, helping folks manage their staff, giving them more ways to reach their customers. Um, and so 
there's really just a lot of value within our ecosystem for sellers of all sizes. So I would say, you know, it's those garage stores to, you know, some of the largest household brands you might imagine and everything in between. So we can, uh, as, a, as I'd be a remiss as a tech analyst not to ask spec or ask you to speculate and you, you, you can, you can decline, but, um, there's a lot of players in that space uh, up market and you're about to be another one. So when I go to NRF 2023, I should be thinking about you, um, in far greater terminology or technology than just, uh, just your, where you've been the last few years. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. In fact, uh, when you go, uh, you'll see me, uh, I'm planning to be there as well. And, oh, fantastic. Uh, uh, yeah. Chat with some folks, you know, um, I think what's really interesting about Square's approach in this space, and, you know, and, and you mentioned, uh, you know, some of the other folks that are also, um, you know, selling uh, solutions to retailers of the of, uh, those sizes of market. What's interesting is that we've got a, quite a broad array of things that we're offering ourselves. And so what's interesting is that um, depending on the size and shape of a retailer you are, there's probably, you know, different pieces of the ecosystem that make a lot of sense. Uh, for some of the smaller sellers out there, we've got free solutions that are, you know, make it really easy to get started, um, you know, skip a lot of complexity and just get you up and running, right? Hence the strength that, uh, you know, those uh, garage sales. Uh, but for your more upmarket sellers, you know, you commit your inventory into our uh, tool as a system of record, which powers your inventory reporting, your ability to forecast, you know, when you're likely to run out of stock, whether you need to uh, resupply something. Uh, tools to allow you to automate, you know, your ability to communicate with your customers, even when uh, you don't have any staff working, right? So it's uh, able to kind of handle off hours through some automation, some ML-based approaches. So, you know, there's really a lot of, uh, it's a very comprehensive ecosystem, which is why uh, we're able to continue to serve retailers of all shapes and sizes. Wow, fantastic. Well, I look forward to coming by your booth and seeing what you're up to. Yeah. Um, this is a, a data point. I'm um, kind of unpacking the the um, the inflation feel. So um, it's about slide three in in the notes. Uh, retailers' sentiment is also mixed about the holiday about the holidays. Uh, will compare to last year. So, in 41 percent say believe it, it will improve. 30 uh, 32 percent say expect business conditions to worsen, and 27 percent think it will remain the same. Um, I'm curious is it is this good news bad news it it feels like it's probably you know i guess as good as we could expect but i mean how would you interpret that data point for the for the listeners yeah you know there's there's something not said uh here that i sort of carry with me as a lens to interpret these types of percentages and that is you know in my time working with small businesses and and retailers obviously included um, there's just a tremendous resiliency. There's a lot of um, willingness to kind of uh, roll with things, to adapt. Uh, and in a lot of ways, some of the challenges that some of these businesses are fearing, um, you know, that's that one third that expect that things might worsen, uh, reminds me of some of what we saw during pandemic when things started to hit. And that is, um, I personally have seen and I continue to have a ton of optimism in retailers' ability to pivot and to adapt to changing circumstances. And so I think some of what you're seeing here is that, yeah, the sentiment is, you know, honestly, realistic, right? Uh, there's a lot of things, whether you look at inflation, you look at supply chain, there's a lot of things that portend um, a lot of turbulence and it's gonna be choppy uh, in the coming months. But, um, you know, the way I interpret results like this is retailers gearing up and being prepared uh, to make the changes they're gonna have to. Yeah, I know I like that interpretation a lot. Um... A lot of us in the analyst world are trying to trying to wrestle with the impacts of COVID, and um, I, I, you probably, since you deal with so so many small retailers, you, you probably feel the impact of it uh, of it worse, I guess, maybe than than most vendors. Um, but boy, the, the amount of innovation that's been driven out of this mess that we've been in the last three years has has been phenomenal for the, those that are survival have survived. It's just been it's been a, a just an amazing um, acceleration innovation. And I guess that's that's the point you're making here. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, the headlines uh, about pandemic uh, are often about things like supply chain, you know, uh, difficulty in getting products, you know, and seeing things that are out of stock frequently at uh, retail stores. Um, what I think goes underreported is just the amount of pivoting that went on, and uh, you know, people moving into 
experiential concepts where, you know, supplementing their retail with, you know, adding the coffee shop. In fact, you know, one of our uh, interesting findings on labor is that, you know, baristas and, uh, you know, more of these um, experiential components as a proportion of the hires that retailers are making, it's those types of roles that are outpacing by far. Uh, so, so what that tells, you know, what that should indicate is that a lot of retailers are open to making all sorts of changes, right? And they're being quite agile in how they think about the value they're providing to their sellers in terms of an overall experience. Um, but there's also a tremendous, you know, um, response to the changing uh, nature of what's gone on, whether it's, a, you know, obviously adopting online uh, channels and more flexible fulfillment was, was pretty key. Uh, but it's also about um, thinking about the product assortment. You know, what is it that folks are more likely to need? Some of the most ins inspiring stories to me have been, for example, right. um, the folks that started stocking up on PPE and selling masks and selling, you know, a number of, uh, you know, pandemic related things. And so, um, but yeah, I, you know, just all underscoring this point about um, adaptability and resiliency. So, I don't know if it's good. I mean, it's, it's great news that we've, the industry has responded um, and, and looks like we have yet more challenges in front of us. Um, the next data point I'd like to talk about is uh, Shop with Soul, and it's a, it's a, a screen grab off, uh, off, the, off, the, off the deck. And what I found really interesting is one in five shoppers prefer to buy products that are sustainable or ethical. This is particularly true uh, among afterpay customers. So, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty big data point. I actually haven't seen that really laid out quite as cleanly as that. Is this is is this on the rise? Is this been stable for the last couple of years? Have you tested this uh, or asked this question in previous studies? So um, there's been versions of this question that I've seen in the past. Um, you know, based on what I've seen, I think what we're starting to see in, in uh, numbers like this is that, yes, I believe it's on the rise. And part of why is I believe it's a generational shift. I think there's a lot of folks, uh, Gen Z in particular, to call it out, where, you know, um, even as, you know, two, three years ago, uh, we were conducting some research and finding that there was just this interest in, um, you know, traceability in the supply chain, knowing, you know, the type of labor and the type of plants, uh, you know, and the, the raw materials that were used in the making of something, um, as well as an interest in, you know, you know, thrifting and uh, consignment and, you know, a whole bunch of uh, ways to reuse and reduce footprint. Um, I think sometimes there's trends and counter trends, right? So I think fast fashion was certainly, uh, you know, rose very quickly and made a lot of things uh, appealing. But I also think the counter trend there is, you know, a little bit of, um, rejection of things that are designed uh, to be almost disposable or, you know, very limited use and wanting, uh, you know, something with more longevity. And so really, I think uh, as um, newer generations um, become more of a, uh, a footprint by dollar in the buying demographic, right, as they kind of uh, grow into uh, a greater share of the overall consumer base, we're also going to see some of their attitudes um, increasing. Well, that was definitely my thought when I looked at that. I just, the, this one just screamed for the, for the uh, demographic breakout. Um, any chance you can comment on what, what the percent of Gen Z was? It, ha it has to be three or four X more than my generation, um, Gen X. Oh, well, I mean, I think for purposes of the data that, that we're pulling here, uh, Gen Z, let's see, I think it was about 14% of the consumers, right? And so it's not like we overwhelmingly sampled right. more Gen Z to include in this data point. And so really what you're seeing is, you know, if you combine uh, Gen Z and millennials, so that's the 18 all the way up to 40 range, um, that's probably about half of the wow. respondents in our yeah. survey here. So um, obviously it's it's more than just that one generation. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, that's a good data point. Um, I haven't seen that broken out quite that clean before, so I, I, I will adopt that one for sure in, in anything going forward. Sure. The other data point I thought that was really interesting was the, uh, the comment on social shopping. Uh, social media is another important influence, uh, and I'm reading from the, uh, from the info infographic blurb. Social media is another important influence with around one in four shoppers spotting uh, gift ideas on Facebook, 27%, and Instagram, 24%. I thought that was kind of interesting that more on Facebook than on Instagram, even though Mark's really fine with, with using either, either one. But um, 
I don't it, kind of interesting. Were you surprised that that more actually a, a couple percentage point more on Facebook than Insta? Yes, I know. So there's a uh, there's a couple things that might be at play here. One of which being there's a lot of sellers that don't have the time, the bandwidth, um, you know, maybe the interest in setting up a dedicated e-commerce site and a channel. And so I think that the default that they end up with is a Facebook site. And so if you think about what a, a retailer thinks of as their online store, um, a lot of them, uh, you know, when Facebook was kind of ascendant, the social, uh, you know, tool spectrum, uh, I think a lot of them ended up, um, you know, spinning something up because it was really quite easy. And, you know, it continues to this day to be a really easy place to to get started and just get the word out and then have something to link to, um, you know, when you're uh, uh, trying to connect stuff with your your shoppers and, and something for them to go back and land on and reference that you can keep current. And so I'm actually not surprised to see uh, a substantial portion there. I think um, Instagram, you start with Instagram getting more into the realm of needs more investment because here to be successful, you need to think about the quality of your photography and uh, meeting your, uh, your buyers where they are in terms of what they expect to find in their feed uh, and making sure that your brand as a seller is represented appropriately on socials for consistency. And so it actually, you know, the, the level of difficulty or rather the level of investment required, I think starts to go up as you consider some of the newer uh, social media channels like Instagram, uh, maybe TikTok and, and some of the others. And then that explains the next, which was next question you already answered. Square and Afterpay found that the majority of businesses plan to enlist a number, the number of online channels. 59% of retailers intend to sell on social media, 45% sell through online store. And that's probably because you've got, you've got the, 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 the small and, and small and, and medium sized retailers. And they're, they are clearly using social as their, as their, as at least one of their major channels. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, uh, again, um, is a little bit behind the numbers here is when you think about the Oh, that's the what I buyers. want. I want behind the numbers. I love behind the Perfect. numbers. Perfect. Glad, uh, glad to be here and then to be able to speak to it. So um, the way I think about the buyer's journey is it's not as linear sometimes as stats may uh, imply. A lot of times what's happening is you're discovering things um, based on your active social media consumption habits. And so you're kind of, you know, scrolling through some posts of like friends and things you like, and then you happen upon a well-placed, um, you know, ad for something that sort of makes you go, hmm, that's interesting, you know? And a lot of us, uh, myself included, have gone, wow, they're actually really good at uh, getting me uh, products that I might uh, enjoy. So there's that discovery aspect. But a lot of times what happens is you don't necessarily go on and purchase it in that moment, right? It's not as impulse driven as you might expect. It lodges in your consciousness and then you might down the road see it echoed to you in an email or mentioned to you by a friend. And then maybe you go to the site and you learn more about it. And ultimately where you make that purchase could be you go into a store or you do it on online or a marketplace. And so when you think about these non-linear buyer journeys from discovery to consideration to purchase of the actual product, I think that that um, starts to drive a little bit of, you know, Social media is super important to get in front of uh, more buyers, right? Because we know just by raw demographics, there's just a lot of time people are spending on social media. Um, but then ultimately, if you get them back to your online store, this is actually a powerful approach that um, I like to advocate to, to retailers in particular, because you get a chance to tell them more about who you are, not just like a tiny few seconds or like an interstitial, but the full story of what your products are about, what you value, the rest of your assortment, uh, and, and by the way, that's not so different than a, a compelling marketplace strategy where you lead one or two of your products, but you don't put your entire product portfolio up there. You have sellers come back and, and actually engage with you in a way where you can get more of your message and your brand and your product assortment across. And so that's why I actually think it's, um, it's a great idea to try and um, drive discovery in some of those broader channels, but pull back more of the consideration and purchase to your own online store. Very interesting. Uh, finally, 16% will leverage selling through text messages via conversational commerce software. Now, I've had a couple of interviews with um, conversational commerce folks. I've, I have found it interesting. Um, I hadn't really seen significant uptake, but I mean, that's a, that's a significant data point. Uh, I, I assume you're, you're, you're high on, on conversational commerce as a, as a major channel going forward. Oh, for sure. I mean, to me, this is, um, you know, meet your buyers where they are. I can tell you, I... Um... I've got a pretty sizable uh, screen on my smartphone. I tell you, I don't like spending much time talking to people. 
Uh, I do like, uh, you know, I will text and message and, and do a number of those things as like my primary means of uh, engaging because, you know, sometimes it's hard to just take the time out to, you know, uh, invest in, in the phone call. So look, commerce should happen wherever there's communication happening and, and meeting your buyers where they are means being able to transact via text messages and, and those types of conversational mediums. Now, it's actually pretty powerful because most of these tools give you not just text back and forth, but images, right? Like, hey, you know, let me show you a few different angles of that, you know, uh, piece of furniture that you're considering, or, you know, let me um, link you to, to something that kind of has the full return policy detailed out. So it's actually a really rich way to go back and forth. But again, meeting, the, meeting your shoppers where they are uh, and kind of on their own terms and schedule, right? So I think this is a really powerful uh, channel, uh, one that Square was really excited to bring about. We have conversational commerce, you know, kind of woven into our ecosystem, including our, our retail solutions. And uh, it's one I actually expect to, um, uh, to rise with time as more folks understand that it's here and, and how to leverage it as a, as a retail seller. Well, 16% is, I mean, that's legit. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, it's a great football. channel right now. Um, that's right. Curious, do you have any, any forecast on, on what amount of spend will happen in conversational commerce? I've, I've kind of looked for that. I haven't really seen any, anything that I put any value to, but 16%, I mean, that's sick. That's a, that's a significant number. Have, have you guys? Yeah, that? that's, that's, I, I don't know that uh, we have it broken out by channel for some of the same reasons I mentioned, which is, you know, it may actually be the transaction happening right. there, or it may be 80% of the discovery and exactly. the asking questions that's interactive, right? But um, what I will say is that, you know, we're trying to make more options available. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that uh, I find really exciting is a, a square checkout link. So in the same way that I uh, mentioned, we want our sellers to make sure that they're using a rich media like their own online store to uh, ultimately convert their buyers. I think, um, you know, a checkout link that you can just send somebody in a text message or post somewhere on social media is kind of a, a one click way to, you know, transact when, when they're ready. So that's, you know, a way you can make that part of it very easy, right? And not kind of filled with friction and, you know, entering a lot of details and, and logging in multiple times. So that's one of those things where, um, you know, Ultimately, the the transaction may happen, you know, in the online check on the online store or in the checkout link. But conversational commerce still plays a really important role, I think, in the um the the evaluation phase. So what I'm hearing from you is I need to pay a lot more attention to conversational commerce over the over uh 2023. Yeah, I think that's right. I Good certainly enough. will be. <laughs> Good enough. One uh, data point that I I found a little bit interesting. I don't know, maybe a little concerning. You helped me unpack that. Uh, 47% of consumers prefer to purchase in-store. So let me tell you how I saw that. And you, t you, you, you correct me or, or set me straight. That concerns me, actually. 47 only? I mean, so here's, here's the interpretation. Only 47% of consumers prefer to purchase in-store? Is that the right inflection? What does that really mean? What's, what's behind this data point? Yeah. Um, you know, the interesting thing here is I would expect this um, to start skewing to more online um, in times of scarcity. And the reason for that is I would expect that more people come in with a plan. They know what it is that they want. And when you know what you want, it's yeah. pretty low friction to go find it online, do your price comparison, you know, and provided the fulfillment terms are okay, usually one or two days, you know, for example, for delivery, you know. Uh, whereas the 47% they're going in store, they likely need more information, right? They don't quite know what it is that they want or know just how um, it's going to look and feel and, you know, some of this experience aspect. Uh, for me personally, uh, the times I go in store is when I need a little bit of uh, expertise. Uh, some of my favorite uh, stores to go in as a, um, a homeowner are um, hardware stores because I think I can figure out with the help of YouTube uh, just what I uh, need to get the job done. But going and talking to somebody is so much better to figure out, you know, just what it is that um, is really going to fix that problem more, more effectively for me. And so I think of in-store as an important channel for expertise, uh, for, the, you know, trying, you know, the look, the feel uh, of something and um, a little bit of discovery as well. I think another piece of this snapshot in, the, in time is also a little bit of a, uh, a reaction, though, uh, to the fact that, you know, um, at any given time, we're kind of in the, the ebbs and flows of um, people's willingness to be in social uh, settings and to be indoors, you know, uh, whether this, you know, it's obviously a lot um, 
safer. You can eliminate uh, human contact by, uh, by shopping online. And so we've got new variants. We've got, uh, you know, flu is supposed to be particularly bad this season. We've got, you know, uh, some of that at play too. And so uh, I find it interesting as a snapshot in time. I, to be honest, would imagine that looking at this split probably May or June of next year would give us more of an indication of what like the kind of longer term trend is going to be. Let me ask you to play analyst. What do you think that split looks like in May or June of next year, higher or lower? Oh, oh, that's interesting. I, um, look, I, I personally am, am really excited about the world where we have vibrant main streets and we're all going in person, uh, you know, to, to really engage with small businesses as a cornerstone of our communities. I do think there's a, an important place for online shopping. Uh, I tend to think, uh, you know, that it's a lot about convenience. It's a lot about um, commodity items, right? But for things that are kind of a little bit more special, more differentiated, um, for me, there's no replacing a uh, small business uh, in store. Now, the other thing I'd say about the, you know, that longer term state is, again, I mentioned experiential earlier, and I, you know, am loving what I'm seeing a lot of small businesses doing by becoming, again, more of that uh, center for their communities. And, you know, somebody who used to only sell, you know, board games is now having um, a coffee shop so people can kind of sit and maybe play a game and try it out. Uh, you know, maybe there's the, the maker in to sign and autograph some things. Maybe there's kind of some music. And, and you know, these are kind of um, the core experiences that are going to be near impossible to replicate online. It's, it's kind of what I see as uh, an evolution of some of that in-store experience. Okay. So ultimately positive. Positive for me. Well, I'm, I'm the biggest fan of small business there is. I get, c growing up in a small business and all my brothers being small business folks. So yeah, I, I think, and most of the, most of the people listening to the pot are, 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 are all pro, uh, uh multi-channel you use the term omni-channel. Um, and yeah, I'll interpret that. I like, I like your interpretation of that. Okay. One last question for you on the data um, was one I, I found pretty interesting. The most popular gift category is vouchers or, or gift cards. Uh, I mean, I guess let me, let me give you my thought on, on, on what I read about that. And then you, you push back um, one. It makes a t total sense. I have twin 25 year olds um, and they are very comfortable with having us buy them gift cards. Usually probably more, more, you know, higher value than, than not. Um, that makes sense. It's more functional. It's they get what they want. Um, but then I look at that as a retailer and go, how do I merchandise a store if the majority of the people want to buy gift cards? Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Um, I do think that, uh, there's a little bit of, um, there is some generational skew here. I think older shoppers, um, tend to, um, prefer gift cards more uh, potentially than younger shoppers. Um, so your question on on merchandising, look, I think um, I think there's something about a store specific gift card uh, that's a little more opinionated than say your generic prepaid you know Visa uh, uh, that's accepted everywhere. And what that is is a bet that you're going to find something really interesting, oftentimes at a, a local boutique retailer. I don't know exactly uh, you know which um, board game, video game, piece of apparel. A uh, piece of electronics that you're going to particularly resonate with, right? Because I don't know everything that uh, that you have as my gift recipient, but um, I'd love to get you something in that category and and make sure that it's impactful and valuable as opposed to just you know something that's going to sit on your shelf. And so you know, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of the flexibility. Now, at some point, someone's going to have to redeem that gift card, yeah. right? And so there's obviously still a need for um, making clear what the value proposition is of, of all the various, uh, you know, um, things in your store and making sure that, um, you can still speak to your, your core consumer because again, uh, and then when they come in with that gift card, who's to say that that's not a, you know, a lifelong loyal customer that, that, you know, you could really be building and investing a lot of relationship in with. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, from a retailer perspective, it's, it's, it's honestly, um, an invitation, right. To, to, uh, gain a new loyal customer you may not have had before by virtue of the gift recipient. And um, yeah, that's just a powerful opportunity. Yeah, you know, I, I guess that's a, the thought. Um, it's one thing to buy it during the Christmas season, but you still have to, uh, obviously you want to redeem it. So does that actually extend the Christmas shopping season then into two or three weeks past uh, past the holidays where 
historically retail has just sort of collapsed over the finish line and just focus on returns. You actually have to probably have maintain a, a little, maybe a little different selection to try to recover all those gift cards that are, that are going to be coming uh, in people's stockings. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I would expect that. Yes, that's true. Um, probably makes a, a good, um, uh, it's, it's probably good practice if you're selling um, a decent proportion of gift cards in, in your overall volume to think about the redemption cycle and what it is that folks are going to need from you. Um, and by the way, uh, those types of uh, calls are made really well by taking advantage of robust reporting, right? So yet another reason why I would say that, um, you know, the way that uh, Square has been tackling this particular one is to make sure, for example, that gift cards are redeemable online and in store, right? So, um, you know, people feel a little bit like there's some flexibility in terms of how they redeem. But having access to the reporting that shows you, hey, watch out, you've got 20%, you know, of your holiday sales actually have to be in gift card form. Uh, folks are going to want to use things and I'm not going to be really excited if, you know, you're sold out of uh, half of your inventory, uh, you know, or maybe they will, depending on the uh, the length of uh, time that they've got to use the thing. So um, that's a great call out. And, and it's something that uh, I would imagine a retailer should certainly be paying attention to in terms of the reporting. You know, I ha hadn't seen that in the conversation. I had never really thought about asking for it, but I think going forward, that is, you know, that is going to be something, and you are probably the folks that are really going to have the best view on that um, as to how big of this trend this is and when those cards get redeemed. And have we basically functionally extended the, the Christmas season all the way to January, um, which probably isn't making a whole lot of retailers happy thinking about, but it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, look, a lot of this depends on the type of retailer. I and mean, one of the things as a secular trend this year is you know that there's a lot of folks, I'm, I'm sure that you've seen and, and your listeners have seen, uh, that there's a lot of surplus inventory out there, right? And so oh, yeah. there's a lot of deep discounting that might be going on. Um, and then, of course, you have your typical post-holiday season discounting as folks try to clear inventory to make way for, you know, the new merchandise uh, in the new year. And so, yeah, these are all dynamics that, um, you know, are worth watching out for. These are things that we uh, will be able to have an eye on with the data. Um, but most importantly, it's stuff that, you know, the retail sellers on our platform will be able to have an eye on themselves. Uh, and that to me is, you know, really the, the magic of making sure you're using, you know, um, robust inventory management tools is you get to predict what's going to happen, um, uh, both in your business immediately and also seasonally. Uh, looking at last year's Christmas is usually a good uh, way to prepare for the next one. Um, asking as an analyst, being very jealous about finding new sources of data, is some of those, are some of those insights available to uh, the general public or the trade press or the analyst community? Um, what, what happens with these gift cards? Because that, that's got to be a major, major trend going forward. Yeah, I, uh, I I can take a note down on that one, uh, and I will uh, because we've been uh, chatting about it here. We do periodically, um, you know, as we find some interesting trends in terms of you know new products that are kind of you know rapidly vaulting to the top of uh, you know, the list, uh, or just kind of seasonal trends. We do periodically, um, you know, share that uh, broadly, and um, this this will be one that I'll add to the list for for us to look into. Oh, that sounds just just uh, fantastic. Well. Um, Man, that was just great data. Thanks for the, all those insights. What, uh, how do you, now that you're, we're, you know, fully well into November, what do you think the next month and a half looks like? I mean, the data is, you know, some of it's a, a month old. Um, any, anything you want to true up or any, any, uh, better, pro, you know, more fresher projections to make? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I can, I can offer opinions. I know that for example, um, you know, generation, generationally, we know that a lot of folks are going to be looking for deals, especially the younger consumers. And so there's a lot of appetite for these, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. And by the way, obviously not those days, that window itself is sort of extending and, you know, holiday shopping is skewing earlier than it has been in the past. Um, so I know that, uh, you know, there's definitely going to be um, some shifts in the timeline. Um, we know that there's still some big variables out there, uh, not only in terms of inflation, but in terms of, you know, what's happening with, um, you know, the latest variants and, you know, how safe people are feeling about in person. But really, uh, the way that I look at this question about, you know, what's coming is really more from a retail seller perspective and, and just thinking through, you know, what they can do to prepare. And so, um, you know, some of the things that, you know, I think we've touched on already is, you know, inflation is for sure here. Um, but just reinforcing and revisiting this point that, Shoppers are still interested to spend. They, they, there's still a lot of appetite for gift giving. It just might be a little bit more opinionated. And so here I would say that really it's a matter of making sure that 
you can reach your target customers and, and it might be a great time to lean into marketing because even though there's these oversupplies of inventory, there's somebody out there that probably wants the things that you're selling. And so you just got to find a way to connect with that buyer, right? Is it in an unconventional way? You know, are you not seeing sales velocity happen the way it used to in the store? And do you need to then take that item and merchandise it on social or merchandise it uh, online? Um, the next thing I'd say really has to do with value. Um, there's a, it's not only about price. I think that's a, a classic thing is, you know, folks just kind of racing to, to be the most competitive in terms of price, but value extends to exchange windows, return policies, uh, maybe some help getting something set up, you know, or maybe kind of, um, you know, just that personal curation of a, of a store owner that says, Hey, you know, here's, here's some things that go together. You know, there's a lot of different ways that value show up. And I would imagine that, or I would, uh, encourage retailers to really be thinking about, um, underscoring the value that they're providing beyond just the price of the item. Uh, Cause that's, that's definitely a big factor uh, that consumers are looking for. Um, and yeah, just really, you know, lean into the early shopping to the extent that you can get the word out. Um, you can leverage, you know, the, the available channels that you're trying to sell on and, and make folks aware of, uh, you know, what you have going into the holiday season. Um, I think it's just going to pay dividends. And so, um, you know, those are just a few, uh, of the ways that I think retailers can prepare. Uh, no matter what's what's coming up ahead. Fantastic. Any um, any uh, thoughts on what you're going to be presenting at or talking about at NRF? Oh, um, well, I think there's a a panel format, and so uh, I have yet to see uh, any teasers for for what the, the core <laughs> topics will be. But but look, it's uh, it'd be hard to imagine that in January we're not in still. Uh, still in some period of uncertainty here with a lot of folks a little bit nervous about, you know, what's going on uh, in the macro environment, whether it's, you know, conflict or supply chain or, or inflation. And so I would imagine that those themes will be present. And, um, you know, we might have some fresh data to look at because it will be the other side of the holiday shopping season. Well, I, uh, I hope I hope you present that because that's going to be really interesting. I, I think that might be one of the more interesting trends that, that I, I hadn't even thought of. It's just the redemption of all those gift cards. So we talked about it um you know, we, we saw it a while ago, um, but boy, I mean, the numbers you have are just are, are, are really dramatic. Well, thanks so much for, uh, for sharing the data with us. Thanks for, uh, you know, helping out the SMB retail. Uh, most of us are big fans of that and look forward to bumping into you at the NRF. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me, Jeff. This was fun. Great. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for giving today's pod a listen and now a view. For more info, check out the show notes and please give us a five-star rating. Like and subscribe, as the kids say. It really helps us grow. If you'd like to be a guest, send me a note. We're always looking for innovative thought leaders and startups really doing interesting things. And make sure to come back for next week's episode.